Hello, and today I'm going to talk to you about <clears throat> some excavations that the University of Sheffield has been undertaking at Thornton Abbey in Lincolnshire, and in particular some of the surprising discoveries, and particularly the, the revelation that the site was also the location of a medieval hospital that was previously unknown. So, Thornton Abbey. Where is it? Well, it's in North Lincolnshire. It's almost within sight of the Humber Bridge, and you can see there on the map. Um, as a bit of a background, it was a major Augustinian house. It was founded in the 12th century in that great period of monastic foundations by William Murgro, one of the great northern barons. And indeed, when he dies in 1179, it's where he chooses to be buried himself. Um, it rapidly becomes a very prosperous house um, and is, is raised in status. So by the 14th century, and the reason I picked that day will come obvious, it has an annual income of about £1,500, which is a very substantial amount of money. And as with all the other monasteries, it's dissolved in the 1530s in Henry VIII's dissolution of the monastery. But like many other sites, it actually continued on in ecclesiastical use and became temporarily at least a college for the training of secular priests. On the death of Henry and the accession of Edward, it's closed down and then it goes through a sort of succession of different owners um, who convert various parts of the site into domestic residences. Now, the reason I give you that background, it kind of explains why the University of Sheffield was there. <clears throat> the site is a large one and it's remarkably well preserved. It occupies about 29 hectares or 72 acres in old money. And as you can see from the aerial shot, um, it's largely just today occupied by arable land. Um, and the LIDAR here on the right shows better the extent of the precinct. So you can see the boundary moats coming around here. And then the eastern side is, is formed by this small beck or stream. And the main cloister area, you may be able to make out there's the church foundations and there's the cloister um, is in the middle, but there's all sorts of lumps and bumps and things going on all around. <clears throat> and that's why we started our work there. We were very interested to sort of pull apart these landscape features that don't really survive in most places as above ground walls and try and understand how the site developed through the various centuries of its occupation and particularly actually after it closed as a monastery. This is the central area of what I've just shown you, the sort of inner precinct and a bit of sort of uh, area outside of that as well, that we undertook intensive uh, geophysical survey. So this is a resistivity survey that produced particularly good results for this site. So all the dark patches or dark areas you're seeing are sort of hard features, walls, you may be able to make out various things. I'm not gonna run through the whole <laughs> geophysics and most of it, almost all of it is relevant to this talk, but you can see things, there's a clearly a building there. That's actually the great monastic barn. We've got other sort of features, which are paths and gardens and so forth. So as part of our work there, what we were doing was trying to sort of sort of see what some of these are through sort of small scale excavation and try and piece together the story of how Thornton had developed. So it was part of this sort of routine survey and excavation work um, that the, the discoveries we made and the, the focus of this talk came to light. And the area I'm particularly interested in is this area down here. <clears throat> We're just outside of the traditional inner precinct, which is bounded on these sides here to the west of the cloister and the church. And within that area, we saw something that was a slightly unusual feature. And you can see it's this sort of rectangular high resistance uh, feature. Now, this was on an area or part of the site known as the mounds. Now, you've got to bear in mind, we're in Lincolnshire, so it's not exactly a mountainous area, uh, but it's, a, it's a, the one part of the site that's about three or four metres higher than the rest of the precinct. Um, and it appears to be a sort of mound of sand. And that's kind of relevant to what I'm going to show you in a bit. <clears throat> 
Now, this mound was variously interpreted as being dumping of sand that had built up in the, the moat surrounding the site. Um, it was also potentially thought to be a natural glacial feature. But um, at the time, that didn't really concern us. What we were interested in is what this sort of rectangular thing on the top of it was. And again, this is the sort of aerial photo here on the right. And the sort of uh, what we're looking at is this is the area of the mound here, <clears throat> which probably isn't very clear. And in this area here is where that sort of high resistance feature is. And we kind of assumed it must be a building because generally, you know, things that are high resistance, uh, you know, is formed by walls or floors, that sort of thing. Um, and given it was quite a sort of prominent location, we thought it may be of some significance to our study. So we put a trench in, as you do, just a small one, and literally just below the turfs, um, we came across this, and it's clearly not a building. Um, and this kind of sort of threw a cat amongst the pigeons because um, it wasn't what we were expecting to find at all. Um, now we are, you know, at the far western edge of the precinct, we're well away from the monastic church and cloister. And, you know, to the east of the monastic church is where you'd expect to find the monastic cemetery. They're always kind of in the same place. So we are really quite some distance from that. And it's probably the last thing we ever expected to find were burials in this area. So, of course, although it wasn't kind of part of the plan of what we were going to do, we thought this needs it explanation we've got to find out why we got burials you know within the sort of the wider monastic precinct in this place to see why we'd made a mistake in terms of thinking this was a building we employed another technique now most of the geophysics you'll have seen before tends to look in plan so you just see an overview, a sort of top view of the features. But we actually employed a different type of resistivity meter, <clears throat> which um, takes a slice, it creates a profile, um, um, which is, is less commonly used in this country. So we ran it across the middle of our feature to look at it. And what you can see in this top picture is like a little slice through the, through the feature. Uh, you may or may not be able to make out the scale here, but this is a metre scale. So it shows that what we were seeing in plan was, was there, we hadn't made it up. Um, it's a shallow rectangular feature at just over a metre deep. And within it, it was quite jumbled, uh, so it wasn't consistent in its fill, but it was clearly an, you know, a, a sort of shallow feature that um, had uh, created this sort of profile. And this got us scratching our heads. And of course, the explanation for why the geophysics was showing unusual results was the fact that we were on a large mound of sand. And it transpired quite rapidly that this was a natural sort of feature. This had been a big dump of sand, probably from the end of the last ice age that had come quite compacted. At some point, um, people have sort of dug into it and then backfilled into this feature things that have created a loosening of that sand. Now that loosening has allowed water to percolate through quicker and therefore it appears drier and that's what has created this high resistance seeming feature. There was nothing structural there, it's just the way the sand was reacting to sort of later activity. So we excavated further in this area, realizing obviously it wasn't a building, but clearly we were in a cemetery. And it also came rapidly clear, this was a very complex um, area of archeology. span We found, and this will be what I'll talk about in a second, we found one episode of multiple interment or mass burial within this cemetery, but there were also ordinary single sort of grave cut burials that were probably broadly contemporary with this mass burial. And then there were later burials, uh, probably you know, a century or so later, that were sort of dug across them as well. So we got lots of intercutting burial, making it very complicated to excavate. But you can see in the picture here, this is one of the, the earliest bits that we were excavating, which is in the middle of the mass burial. Um, and you can see clearly skeletons laid out regularly, and then 
between the shoulders of these individuals, you've got the legs of, rather disturbed, unfortunately, but you've got the legs of the next row space between. So they're clearly being placed into the ground at broadly the similar time. Um, they, they're not intercutting in any way. Now, this was a very challenging excavation partly because the, the sand is quite acidic. The preservation of the bone was very poor. Um, you've got an individual here on the screen that's actually one of the better preserved ones, but even in this case, the rib cage is largely gone. The upper arm area is, is, is in very poor condition. And this is, a, um, it's not quite an adult, this is a, a young, so sort of, well, sort of teenager, um, but suddenly for for the for the younger individuals buried, sometimes we would only get sort of few bits of bone remaining, um, and the later disturbance had created um, other problems. So the way we excavated was using georectification. That's placing these tags around bodies, uh, taking photo multiple photographs from which we can then reconstruct the bones. Because what we couldn't do, which perhaps you might do in a more traditional excavation, is expose everything and then excavate it and then have a lovely overview photo. The condition of the bones was just too poor for that. And indeed, uh, at least one of the summers we were digging here, it was extremely dry and very hot. So the bone was, you know, the moment it was exposed, started to degrade. So over the course of three seasons, we excavated a large area of this cemetery and then pieced it back together afterwards in plan using these techniques. So I mentioned there were multiple phases of burial. But the sort of first one, and actually the area that we, we hit first, so to speak, uh, was a, uh, a large mass burial. And here is a plan of it. Um, there's, what this plan doesn't show is there's actually other burial that's broadly contemporary with this mass burial around it down on this side. But this plan does then show the latest phase of burial cutting right across it. And I'll show you some photos of that a bit later on. Um, so the mass burial conformed to the shape of the geophysical feature we had seen. Um, it was full of individuals um, laid out in a single layer. Um, our interpretation now is that this probably was a pre-existing feature. It was probably a quarry pit that had been cut into the sand. And you can see there are later ones from probably only the last couple of centuries that have been dug in. This is a very pure sand, so people are probably digging into it regularly to take the sand out, uh, to make it into mortar or whatever. So this was probably a pre-existing feature. Uh, potentially in this area. And then at some point people have laid out um, broadly in one go a whole mass of bodies. Um, when I say broadly in one go, our suspicion is actually that this was probably filled up over a short period of time, maybe days, possibly a few weeks, um, rather than necessarily all the bodies being put in literally in the same day. Now, of course, as I mentioned, the bone preservation is poor. So as you can see, for some individuals, you've only got little bits of them that survive. For others, uh, they survive rather better. Um, and also the problem when you're looking at plans of skeletons is that you, you know, I am not a skeleton. So when you're burying a, a person, you're not burying a skeleton, you're burying a fully fleshed person. So actually what I like to do is to put the flesh back on the bodies, so to speak. So I've done a sort of reconstruction here <clears throat> and it kind of makes it easier to visualize, uh, but also makes a number of important points that even though if you sort of, if you bulk out the bodies a little bit, all of them are, are placed quite tightly. Some of them almost well touching within the grave, but they're not cutting each other. It's not like a standard cemetery where later graves may cut earlier ones, that sort of thing. Um, and you can see sort of quite how tight packed it is. Now we've got 48 individuals um, that we we're able to excavate, but uh, there would have originally been more. Some are lost to modern disturbance in this area. And then some of the later burials that were particularly dense just completely destroyed part of the original mass burial. So, you know, we could have, um, you know, easily had quite a few more. You'll also notice some sort of gaps in, in certain areas of the burial. Um, and they may be genuine gaps where no one was buried, but it's our suspicion that actually there may well be uh, 
individuals that particularly sort of the very young who have been buried and just simply haven't survived because you could have easily fitted in between in some of these gaps sort of uh, small individuals so we've got 48 people but that's probably a significant underestimation of the number that were originally buried in there so when you look at you know the sort of profile of who these individuals are the first sort of thing that strikes you is the very high proportion of non-adults um, so these are people kind of under the age of about 18 um, and you know indeed over 50 percent of the individuals recovered fall into this age group um, the demographic profile again we're talking about relatively small numbers for, for a graph, but it shows a sort of high number of, of very young, not, well, much, few, far fewer sort of younger adults, and then again, some older adults. Um, interestingly, when you look at the, the sex of these individuals, now with, with children, it's notoriously hard, almost impossible to accurately sex them. But of the, the adults, we can see that uh, of the adults that were excavated for no sex could be determined, but the remainder there are 11 male and six female. So you broadly got roughly a 50-50, not quite I know, uh, but a sort of fairly even distribution between males and females. Now, of course, we're within a monastery um, and this is not necessarily what you would expect in a standard monastic cemetery. A, we've got large numbers of, of very young children, and also we've got a very significant presence of females. So it clearly points to the fact that this is probably not the religious themselves being buried, uh, but people, you know, possibly from the local community. So we've got an unexpected cemetery, which contains a mass burial. Of course, what we wanted to do is know when is this mass burial from? Well, there's all the sorts of ways that you date things traditionally within the fill of the mass burial. Uh, there was actually very little apart from the bodies. The bodies were shrouded, but they, you know, there was no material culture surviving. But there were a few little bits and bobs that appear to have accidentally either fallen in or been included. So we had bits of 14th century ceramic. You can sort of see this is my favourite example because it's very rare you get a piece of pottery so definitively connected to a body but actually tucked under the chin of this individual, this, this very young person. We actually had a penny of Edward III, all pointing to this taking place in the 14th century. So we did radiocarbon dating, you can see it here. Um, the problem is that the radiocarbon calibration curve wobbles at this point in the medieval period, so you can't get accurate dates beyond telling us what the pottery had already told us for a fraction of the price, uh, that this burial dated to around 1300 to 1400. So what is killing people in the 14th century? Well, the obvious candidate is the, the Black Death, uh, which we know arrives in Lincolnshire early in 1349. And we've got contemporary accounts from other nearby monasteries, some more informative than others, but in the Louth Park Chronicle, we get reference to many of the monks dying. Um, in the Muse Chronicle, um, even close to 14 miles away, just across the Humber, we get more of an accurate description of this pestilence grew so strong in our monastery as it did in other places, that when it ceased, only 10 monks and no lay brothers were left alive, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, it's, it's always a, an obvious candidate, but it's important to remember that there's lots of things that kill you in the 14th century. Um, earlier in the 14th century, there was the Great Famine that caused a, a lot of significant societal stress and, and death. But there's also localised incidents. So we know in Thornton, there was a record in 1332 of a flooding which caused cattle blight, which also caused um, a sort of uh, higher mortality. So what we did was to look for ancient DNA and we sent off a number of samples uh, from various individuals um, in the mass grave for their DNA analysis, not expecting very great results just because the body is in such poor condition. The chances of ancient DNA of pathogens surviving 
um, was very slight. But from two of these individuals, we got positive traces of Yersinia pestis, which is the pathogen that causes the plague. So we're pretty, you know, that's pretty conclusive evidence that this is a Black Death mass grave. But why is there a Black Death mass grave here in a monastery in the sort of outer precinct of it? Well, it's one of those things, once you start knowing something, you start looking around a bit. So this top picture, this is actually the excavation going on is creating this feature here. But when we started looking at the broader topography of the site, we saw that there was a rectangular kind of building just to the south of it on an east-west alignment, kind of looking quite chapel-like. And when you go back to the documents, there is a single reference in 1322 for payments for the repair of the hospital without the walls of Thornton Abbey. Now, people had already assumed that meant outside of the main precinct. But of course, where we are again, this is the inner precinct here. We're just outside the inner precinct. So perhaps, um, you know, we thought that is the reference uh, to, to the hospital. Um, and again, why would we get, you know, Black Death burials of, of presumably a lay population taking place here at the hospital? Well, we know that during the Black Death, um, there was significant pressure on existing cemeteries, on parish cemeteries, that sort of thing. And special dispensation was made for people dying from the Black Death to be buried either in new cemeteries, such as at East Smithfield in London, or in pre-existing cemeteries that wouldn't ordinarily be used for this purpose. So I've just put a quote here, I won't read it out. A quote from the Bishop of Worcester, um, allowing people in that diocese to bury the Black Death dead in hospital cemeteries. So we get kind of these things sort of taking place as emergency measures. So that's that's the assumption we are making for why we might have this mass burial at Thornton. Um, Thinking about the hospital itself, I mentioned it's kind of outside of the inner court, but actually it's in a very good location for the for a hospital because we have the hospital chapel here, which I'll show you more of in a moment. It's on this mound, so it's kind of physically separated from the religious core. But interestingly, the modern farm track that goes up to the farm today is actually going through a medieval entrance. So you've kind of got a, a, a back entrance into the abbey where you can come to the hospital without coming through the main gatehouse, which is up here. So it's actually a very good location for an institution such as a hospital. So we decided to investigate this just to make sure our hypothesis that this was a hospital was correct. So this is the area of the mass grave up here. And then there's some other sort of contemporary burial. And then down here is the hospital building. It's a single cell um, chapel. So it's just you know very plain rectangular building. But then it has a brick extension. It's basically a lean to set of buildings that are built against it. And this is you know quite typical for what you'd expect for a medieval hospital or a chapel forms the core of it. And then you'd have sort of residential potentially or other more domestic buildings around it. Interestingly, I think the final bit of evidence that this is the hospital that was mentioned in the document is that we have archaeological evidence for a restoration of this building at some point in the 13th, 14th century. I mean, it's very difficult to date precisely. Underneath the later floor of the, of the chapel building, this is the west end of the building, we actually have this little lead melting hearth, which was sort of associated with uh, making and melting down window leads. So they're replacing windows, essentially. And then on the outer face of the building, in certain places, we actually found um, evidence for a sort of an external refurbishment. You've got these are bricks that have been very crudely mortared on to the outside of the face of the building, which is clearly quite degraded. So what they've done is just a bit of a cheap restoration job. They've kind of slapped brick on to patch it up and then they've mortared over the whole thing. You can actually see patches and mortar there just to kind of so you couldn't see this patchwork. So we, we can see evidence for a you know, substantial renovation of this building at about the same time as the document uh, mentions those repair works taking place. Um, I'm not going to go through all the other burial that was going on. 
but as I mentioned, um, there is burial, um, a sort of broadly contemporaneous to the mass burial, um, but in single normal graves. And then we have a final phase of later burial probably from the 14th, 5th, well, 15th century, uh, which cuts through the early burials. They clearly didn't know where they were. Um, and these are sort of in ones that are uh, deeper burials. Um, and also they're mainly double or triple burials. And this, this example of a single person is an interesting one because you can see they've cut through um, the earlier mass grave in this case. They've clearly come across bones and they've just plonked the bones in the backfill of the later burials. So there's kind of a whole lot of things we can say about sort of churchyard management here, but that's that's a different lecture. Interestingly, the demographics for the non-mass grave burials are different. Um, and again, I don't have time to go into this in, in huge detail. The most striking difference is that there's a much stronger bias towards male burials, whereas the Black Death burial, the mass burial, you know, is broadly mixed male, female. For these other bur burials from the, the non-mass grave, we have 61 males as opposed to just nine females. So that's a very different kind of population being buried, suggesting that this isn't a normal mixed population. Now, what that population is, is perhaps a topic for a different talk. Um, and then the age profile is rather different and interesting too. We have very few young, very young, but the, quite a peak of people in the age group of sort of about five, six to sort of 11, 12 range, and then some older people. So I'm, I'm not going to go into that, but just to say that there's a clear difference in the burial profile between the mass grave and the rest of the cemetery. I just want to end by moving it on from the dead bodies. Um, in that there's much more that tells you about a hospital and the activity that goes on there. Um, we've got several pieces of material culture as well. My favourite is actually this rather uninspiring object. Um, this is a large lead ampulla, which is basically a little bottle made out of lead. Now, normally when we find these things archaeologically, they're tiny. They're maybe, you know, a couple of inches um, high at best, <clears throat> and they're for storing holy water or oil. This one is a, a massive one. Um, I've never seen one as big as this. Um, but again, if it's for storing holy oil, that would be some sort of something essential for use in a hospital because you'd be anointing the dead. You'll be preparing their bodies for burial, that sort of thing. So you may well need larger quantities of, of holy oil. But and interestingly, this one, when it's gone out of use, somebody's slashed at it with a knife. You can probably see cut marks on it to cut it in half to deliberately destroy it. And then this was actually buried just outside the east end of the church, almost to sort of stop it being you know, put to secular or profane use. And the final piece of material culture we found in the very last phase of the hospital buildings was this lovely little cross, pendant cross, it's a Tau cross. Um, and you can see the wounds of Christ depicted on one side of it. Um, and this is a, a type of cross that seems to have some talismanic function. Um, we see them either in the case, the examples I put up here, are they, these are all ones that have been used as reliquies for holding a little holy relic, but we find them depicted in other contexts with, with pilgrims, that sort of thing. And it's been a sort of suggested that they may have had some sort of pseudo uh, medical purpose as protecting against a condition called St Anthony's fire, which is ergot poisoning, which is caused by eating damp grain. So maybe this is something, again, telling us a little bit about the activity of the hospital. So I've just given you a little overview of the discovery of the hospital, which was completely unexpected, the sort of even more unexpected discovery of a Black Death mass grave, but also the fact that this is you know, the mass grave is just one episode in a sort of much longer period of activity with this hospital, um, which really illuminates a side of life at Thornton Abbey, but also in, in Lincolnshire itself, that we had no clue about before this. Thank you. <laughs>